Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I know it's been a long evening. Thank you for staying. Thank you, Janine and Daniel and Ivy for your stories. Um, I have some notes. I'm going to try not to use them, which means like if I just go blank. Um, I've been writing and researching about same-sex sexual behavior in animals, so you can just shout out an animal, and I'll tell you if that animal is gay or not. Um, so if I go blank, that's what happens. I'll just put these out in case I need them. Um, but I'm going to ask you to put down your beer or your wine just for a moment and just take your wrist and move your hand forward and back. Hopefully, most of us, unless we've had skiing accidents or something, can get to about 180 degrees, um, which actually makes Homo sapiens stand out among primates um, because it's been really useful for us. We can throw a spear, we can hold a shield, we can use tools in all sorts of subtle ways. Uh, but bonobos, uh, one of our closest ape relatives, can reach forward, uh, but they can't actually reach back. Uh, their hands are sort of naturally like this, uh, and the bone is fused along the back of the wrist. Um, and the reason is, they have these prehensile toes, so it's like they have four hands instead of having two hands and two feet. And in the treetops, they can get up to about 30 miles per hour going from branch to branch. And if you had our wrist and you hit a branch, it would just snap, it would break. Uh, but the bonobo wrist works like a lever and swings them around so they can keep going through the trees. So they could totally out Tarzan, Tarzan. Um, but I am, um, so my big, I wrote about bonobos 10 years ago for a young adult novel called Endangered. And I visited a lot of middle schools uh, talking about that book. Um, and I think I probably presented about bonobos to upwards of 50,000 middle school kids. So I, it's sort of like being a politician, like you get your stump speech and like I will do my author school visit and I'm like saying lines and I can't remember if I've already said them in this presentation or not. Um, and I'm just like getting through each auditorium session, but I've come to notice something, um, which is when I ask the students to do this wrist move, I have them do that and then I show a picture of a bonobo on the screen. And if it's sixth grade, all those kids use, like, look at their wrist, they learn about the bonobo wrist. I put up this bonobo on the screen and I start with the really cute ones and they're like, oh, all together. And then when it comes to seventh grade, I lose about half the room in that activity. So the girls will still do it all, the boys will put up their wrists and they'll hear what I'm telling them to do and they'll sort of like look around and like do a half-hearted gesture and then put it down. And I realize it's this moment like, I recognize it from my own middle school life. This moment of like putting your hand forward as a boy um, was a, a fearful act for me. It was a way to get called gay or worse in the hallways. And I could see these boys navigating it and negotiating it. Um, and it's just made me really curious, like what do these boys lose between sixth and seventh grade? What do they learn that loses them having access to this very simple gesture of moving their wrist um, across the country? So it got me thinking, like I was like, who was I in middle school? And I'm trying to give like a portrait of middle school Elliot. It's, um, it's hard to go there. <laughs> um, but let's see, second shortest kid in the class, which was useful, so I wasn't immediately stuffed into lockers. Like, it's like in a horror movie, like as long as you're not the slowest one, then you'll live through that scene. Um, so I didn't get stuffed in the lockers. I had a bright blonde bowl cut. I avoided attention as much as I could because all attention was negative as far as I could see. And I really just like, tried to learn what would make people think I was gay and stop doing it. Uh, and so there were all these tests we had. You know, are you a homosexual or a homo sapiens? And you had to know the right answer. That one was pretty easy. Um, like, ask someone to come up to you in the hall and say, like, show me your nails. And if you showed them the nails like this, it meant you were straight. But if you showed them your nails like this, it meant you were gay. Um, so you had to learn that one, too. And it's just all this policing, this like internalized policing around masculinity that I also had um, growing up. And it's, it's really ironic that the bonobos have their wrists stuck like this. Um, because for the last two years, I've been researching um, homosexuality in animals. And bonobos are like as bi as it gets. Um, and they're just like walking around, male and female, with their wrists like this. And um, so bonobos, I think, are like so inspiring about where we came from. Um, they are tied with chimpanzees as our closest relatives. So they both share, depending on who's doing the science, one pulls ahead, but about 98.7% of their DNA with, with humans. And they're like totally different models for where we came from. Chimpanzees are patriarchal and violent. They will murder each other. 
bonobos are pacifistic, they are matriarchal, um, and there's been no recorded instances of them killing each other. Um, and so we've long known that bonobos have this connected mothers is the structure of their society. Um, and it wasn't until like, sort of the last 20 years that we're really getting frank about why they're so connected. And it's from really, really frequent sexual activity. Um, like many, many times a day, the most frequent sexual act among bonobos is between females. Um, they will still have sex with males. They'll still have offspring. They're not an evolutionary dead end in any sort. They will still have um, you know, baby bonobos for the next generation. But they're mining all the benefits of this frequent sexual activity, which produces oxytocin, which is known as the bonding hormone. And it means these females feel very, very close. And it allows them to have, I kind of, I call them like the pink ladies. They're like this like all-female society of like a sort of a police force that keeps the male in line, males in line and prevents them from acting up. Um, so it's this like central irony about the wrist part, um, but like it goes beyond bonobos. So nature did a study uh, a couple years ago, like just compiling all the data that's come from individual scientists, zoologists working with their animals, and put the number at 1,500 and counting with significant peer-reviewed research uh, into this same-sex sexual behavior in these animals. Um, one of my favorite examples is the bottlenose dolphins. So I was thinking of this with the, um, uh, talking about Michael Phelps being the sort of handsome dolphin man. <laughs> um, bottlenose dolphins, like male sexual friendship is the structuring element of their society. And they put the bonobos to shame. Like males will have sex on average 2.4 times an hour, <laughs> which sounds exhausting. Um, <laughs> And through this, develop these really tight male unions that allow them, they'll invite a female in for a couple weeks, they will play around dolphin style, um, and then the female will go off on her own, uh, raise her calf with other females or by herself, and these males are the only lasting social unit within the dolphin society. Um, and it goes into like sort of animals that cross uh, sexual binaries too, like cleaner wrasse and clownfish or coral reef drawing fish in which you have either an all-female or all-male society, except for the one at the head, depending on which species. When that head dies, it's, an, it's a 100% all one sex, and then about two hours later, whoever's at the top of that hierarchy will change sex to be the, the other sex. Uh, this is happening across coral reef, reef fish, across all coral, uh, coral reefs around the world. I mean, the fish pride flag would take hours to color in. It's like, <laughs> The number of like, so you have like some male fish who are female before and then they go back to female if another male comes in and challenges them, like it just would take forever. Um, all the glitters, you'd have to have a lot of glitter colors, I guess. Um, and uh, I think my favorite though, my favorite uh, same sex sex in animals, if that's, if I can say that, is um, the Japanese macaques. And these are the snow monkeys, if you've ever seen these amazing YouTube videos of these monkeys in these hot baths surrounded by snow, uh, and they've found this like naturally occurring bath as a place to be. And because they're all in one place all the time, it basically turns into like Beverly Hills 90210. They're like <laughs> just socializing nonstop, and whoever's in charge matters a lot, and so they're always grooming each other to figure out who's in charge. But the females also have a lot of sex. It's also the most frequent sexual act among these Japanese macaque monkeys. And this really stymied primatologists who feel you know, that animals for the most part are these evolutionary cogs, the product of adaptations that must have some sort of selfish gene explanation. And these females were having all this sex that doesn't produce offspring, which on the surface seems like an evolutionary quandary. Um, and so what they did is they tested all these good adaptive reasons for why they might be. So primatologists would say, oh, you know, I think maybe Maybe the females are bartering for parental care. So one female is getting another one on her side by having sex with her so that she'll take care of her offspring. Another one would argue that they're reconciling after fights. So after a really bad conflict, they'll have sex as a way to come back together. Um, my very favorite theory uh, was that the females were staging these sexual encounters to excite the males. <laughs> Which, when I read that one, I was like, you wish, guys. Like, this is like... It's like the late night Cinemax version of what's going on for these, uh, these snow monkeys. Um, and I've thought about this a lot recently with the recent challenges, um, especially as someone who writes for young people, um, these recent challenges um, against books that have LGBT characters um, or even non-white characters, female, that look into female sexuality, all these books are getting challenged and removed from, from schools. 
Um, when science has made like huge leaps in the last 20 years into really finding really fascinating reasons for all this same-sex sexual behavior, we are, we are removing, removing it from libraries and schools. Um, and I think it's all about this sort of contagion theory of, of sexuality, right? That if a kid doesn't ever get exposed to a book that has a lesbian in it, then she won't become a lesbian. And if you really think that homosexuality is something that you could learn or that could be, could be passed to you, then that kind of makes sense on the surface. Where, but while the science is really telling us like it is absolutely a part of being part of being an animal. And the language around unnaturalness has huge consequences. This internalized shame that comes with feeling you're unnatural. Uh, Trevor Project did a survey last year that found 45% of LGBTQ young people had considered suicide. Um, this feeling that there's something inherently wrong with you, which without access to the science would seem to be true, um, is, is really, really damaging. And the word unnatural is attached to the the bulwark of anti-gay laws around the world, including Uganda's reinforced capital punishment just last week against uh, aggravated homosexuality, as they call it. And so this writing a book about queer ducks and other animals um, really got me, for, especially for teenagers, got me a lot of angry responses from people, um, especially when there was an NPR piece that ended up on Facebook. And Facebook is like, Twitter is pretty lefty, I'm finding out, and Facebook is definitely not. Um, the, that article got about 10,000 comments, and a lot of the angry ones were just saying I was a pedophile and a groomer and coming after their children, which is so remote to my lived experience that it feels like a, a playground insult almost, like calling me turd breath or something. Um, but I do know it has, they're trying to dehumanize me, which is obviously very um, scary. But the other, the other comments that were angry had more heft to it and were something we could actually talk about. Like people would say, um, well, animals do all sorts of things we wouldn't want humans to do, right? Animals will throw feces. They will eat their partners after they have sex with them. They will eat their own offspring. You're not saying we should do that, right? So why are you saying that humans should be LGBTQ because animals are? And it, it's an interesting argument. It's something that you can actually talk about, unlike being called a pedophile or a groomer. Um, and I've had some of those conversations um, but I think it ultimately it's getting the argument of the book and what I've come to learn from this research entirely backwards. Um, I think it is tortuous to say that humans should act one way because animals do, because there are sorts of, all sorts of animal behaviors we don't want don't to copy. But we can no longer say that humans are unnatural for their queer identities. Um, this is in, invertebrates, vertebrates, fish, birds, land animals, um, we find it in, in species after species after species. And so this argument that we are alone in our queerness or we are somehow human blips in time that don't have any natural referent actually has no intellectual weight anymore. Um, queerness is, is part of our animal heritage. It's what bonds us with the natural world. Thank you. If someone shouts out an animal, I'll tell you if it's gay. All right. Penguins super, super bi. Thank you, everybody.